Um, just to introduce uh, Dr. Osma Louise, who's from Macquarie University. So uh, Osma's a fish ecologist and interested in uh, fisheries uh, fish biogeography. Uh, so he's originally from Brazil and uh, did his undergrad there and spent many years surveying fish uh, along latitudinal gradients in Brazil and um, did, uh, ended up doing a master's there before moving to Macquarie University to um, take a PhD with Josh Maiden, who's uh, closely affiliated with many people here at the centre, uh, looking at the biogeography of reef fishes. Um, Osmar's had a very diverse <coughs> career and has published papers on, as well as biogeographies, described new species of fish and has a very, very extensive knowledge of uh, reef fish, uh, especially in, in Brazil. So uh, without further ado, I'll uh, introduce Osmar. Thank you. Uh, I wish to thank you, uh, Tom, and people that uh, have uh, been here to, to this talk. Uh, well, a couple of months ago, uh, Sean Connelly went down to Macra Uni and gave a talk, and I, I was very pleased to, to see in the end that he, uh, he, he, he said that uh, trade based ecology was one of the most exciting things that going to happen in the community ecology. <laughs> it's actually working a bit, but this is from the, his new paper on PNIS. So, uh, so, uh, ecological traits are going to be like a very promising field of research. And there's actually an explosion of uh, traits based uh, research in ecology nowadays, mainly in plant ecology. Of course, because plants is easy to, to survey and get traits because they don't move. But uh, for all other organisms, uh, the trait based ecology is, is, is very, uh, it's in fashion right now. And, uh, and before I start, uh, there are some definitions of traits that I can ask the people who are not much, uh, fa familiar with traits. Uh, this is from the two uh, most, uh, the two bet 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 better reviews about traits that I read recently. So traits is any morphological, uh, physiological, physiological, any uh, property or feature of organism, usually but not always uh, measurable at the individual level. I will show some uh, data when I, when I measure uh, traits at the population levels as well. Uh, and it's used, uh, usually used to uh, comparatively among across species. So that's uh, the definition of the, the species trait approach. You, you can analyze traits between individuals with the same species, of course, but this is more uh, um, uh, across species. So, and of course, uh, you can define a functional trait if the end of the trait is direct influencing the, the performance of the organism. So, uh, the traits can be, as I said, morphological. Uh, you, you can look at the body size of species, the shape of the body, uh, the shape of the fins, uh, you can look at the uh, larval duration, some physiological stuff, uh, reproduction, like fecundity, lifespan, uh, behavior traits, like schooling, uh, if they perform uh, cleaning uh, behavior or not, if they are territorial or not, what they eat, and, and some biogeographical traits, which is it's more in the population level, like the geographic range, uh, the abundance, and the structure of the population. And these uh, traits are used as a factors in analysis when you're looking for like, uh, explain some, some, answer some questions. And uh, these traits usually can go with one of these distribution orders. They are continuous or binomial, uh, yes or no, uh, one or zero. They are count data or categorical data. But the, the big strength of the trait based approach is. is uh, here as an example, what we usually do in uh, when you are researching, uh, we are all, uh, usually looking at the abundance of the individual of the species uh, level. So we are looking at the identity of the species, uh, and we have a plot like that. For example, we can compare the abundance of, for example, of that denser fish in the lagoon and in the crest, and you can see that that denser fish is 
uh, is more abundantly the lagoon, and then the other species of denser fish are placed then in the crest. And that species of parrot fish is more common on the coast, and then when you go to the mid shelf, the other species of parrot fish is becoming more abundant than the other. But what this actually brings to us, because we are looking at these species only, uh, when, when you go to the traits of that species, you, you can read a plot like that. And then you have the same data. The two large circles is the, is the two more abundant species there. And when you look at that, when you, you, when you ignore the, the name of the species and look at the traits, and then, uh, then you can usually make, uh, uh, you can generalize this to another regions, to another reefs, to another place, to another species. So if you, if you study part of fish in the Great Barrier Reef, and then how, how does this uh, apply to the Caribbean, for example? Then, so when you look at the traits in, in, in this plot, you can see that species with the trait, higher levels of the trait one, and, 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 and average levels of, of, the, of the trait two, they are more abundant in that specific place when you sample. When you, and then now you can compare the distribution of the traits instead of the species, and, and now you can generalize this more broadly. <clears throat> uh, but the species trait approach uh, has some bottlenecks, some <coughs> difficulties that we need to, to, to surpass. Uh, one very important is the trait data itself. So the trait data, as is not nicely put there, is uh, at best dispersed through the literature and the words lacking altogether. So when you look to a particular trait that's not re readily available, you need to go to the literature and do a uh, comprehensive search to compile, for example, that on the depth range of, of, of species or of the diet. Or if it's lacking altogether, then you need to go to the field and co collect yourself. Uh, and another constraint is methodological tools. Several questions on, on, on traits. Uh, the data are not suitable to, to analysis uh, to the, that you are uh, traditionally using in your college. So you have, uh, it's very common to have distribution, uh, uh, response variables with binomial di distributions, like yes or no, the, that species is excluding species, yes or no, uh, or a percentage. Uh, some data is, is counted data. Uh, for example, how, how many eggs uh, there's in the mass of a bird, for example. Uh, there's a many distributions with many zeros on it. And for this, now we have, uh, nowadays, there's a, a very assortment of modern approaches. Uh, you, you can use generalizing linear models, booster regression trees, to tackle these this, uh, this distributions that is, is, is not normal. And uh, another issue is uh, many data sets is, has very aggregate data. They are usually aggregate in regions or uh, families, uh, and then you need to, to go to, for mixed effect models to, to model this correctly. And uh, and another <clears throat> very important constraint in trait-based analysis is the biological knowledge of the organism you are studying. It's very now we you you have a large data sets available on the internet. You have fancy uh, models, of, uh, statistical models to 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 modeling the, these data sets. But if you don't know the organism you are studying, <coughs> so you, you 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 don't go much further than. They just uh, exploring the data. Uh, in, during my PhD, when I start to learn all this stuff, it's very common people that came from the other departments uh, for all other labs with uh, data sets in palm trees. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, can you help me to model this stuff? And so I have the data set, I have the tools, but I don't know how to formulate the questions to answer this. And this uh, has uh, one thing that I notice very, that's very more and more common, unfortunately, is that people that are learning to do all these modeling techniques, uh, people have access to, to large data sets, but they are just 
they, they start to run the analysis without formulating the hypothesis they, they, they meet you, the questions they want to question beforehand. And this is, so this is my opinion is wrong, it's, it's doing science backwards. You're testing a lot of traits and see you're sort of fishing for positive p, p values, and, uh, but uh, in, in the end, uh, you, 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 you don't have like a, a, a strong a statistical uh, a hypothesis test uh, approach. So, uh, yeah. trait, species trait approach, in my opinion, is, a, is, a, is very cool. I, uh, I like it very much because it's, it's a very quantitative analysis uh, that is uh, combined with uh, natural history, a lot of natural history data that you need to have. So it's a, in a, in a, in a world when biologists now need to do more and more uh, uh, quantitatives, it's a, it's a oasis of natural history and the beauty of the idiosyncrasies of organisms that you need to know before uh, uh, doing this, this sort of uh, analysis. Uh, so, I've been uh, hooked by trait-based analysis since I started my PhD, and uh, two things that I'm very keen to, to do it is first, is to revisit all the questions about Fisher College, things that are not well sorted out, is still controversy, and see how, how the trait-based analysis can help to explain or, or to advance these fields of uh, these, these particular questions, and uh, looking forward to the conservation part and, and try to to uh, make more applied research using uh, ecological traits. Uh, one of the old questions, the controversies that I look at is about the dispersal of fish. So when you look to geographic ranges of fish, you we, we know that there are many fishes that are widespread in the Indo-Pacific Ocean. They go from East Africa into the Panama, or Galapagos. We have, we have species which are more modest distribution. Uh, and we have even single island banks. And people for a long time ask, why there's such variability in, in geographical range size? Uh, of course, that because we know that uh, the reef fishes have a uh, uh, two-phase life story. The fish that we see on the reefs, the adult phase, they are rather sedentary on the reef. They move like uh, they have small home ranges, and they have a larval phase when they disperse. We always think that the duration of this larval phase is the main determinant of the geographical range size of the dispersal potential of reef fish. And uh, the first review that comprehensively look at that, the last in Rutenberg, 2005, they analyze geographical range size against PRD for really different regions and, and, and <coughs> found that this is, PRD is not a general prediction. You have you have even negative correlations or no correlations, or even when you have a positive correlation, it's not that strong. And uh, in another paper, Camilo Moore in 2012, he, he thought, okay, maybe, maybe because older species has more time to disperse, you know, so maybe if you if you are a generous, fellow generous older, they have more large branches, but again, the the results was very uh, mixed. So for some families it works, for some other families not. So in the end, we don't have uh, uh, yet a good idea of what uh, makes the, the, this geographical variability in, in range size. Uh, and, but what we know is that PRD <coughs> is, is a poor predictor so far for refugee range size. Uh, I become interested in these questions when I, as I said, when I start my PhD. This is, this is the first chapter of my PhD. And uh, uh, I, I was born and raised in Brazil. And of course, this is a beautiful country to, uh, for a biologist to grow up. I can 
I could do my, my weekend bushwalks in the rainforest. And, uh, but I was always very upset about our reefs. Why, uh, why the Brazilian reef is, is, is not so diverse as the Caribbean ones? They are so close. And I start to, of course, there are a lot of species that goes down from Caribbean to Brazil, but the majority not. And I start to look at uh, why uh, some species are not coming to Brazil. And when you look to the other side of the Atlantic, the coast of West Africa, the situation is even worse. The diversity is way over, lower than, than Brazil itself. And then I, I become interested in to in know which, how, how these species, uh, the difference between the, the widespread species in the Atlantic with the endemic species. And, uh, and I start to compare the species that cross the two barriers to dispersal, that the, the, the Atlantic itself, the large extension of the Atlantic Ocean, and the mouth of the uh, Amazon River, which is a huge uh, discharge of fresh water and, and suit that, uh, that makes a hurdle for, for species to, to come down. And uh, the first thing I thought, oh, maybe species that uh, spend more time in the plankton, as the ones that's coming down, that disperse more than the others, that are more that, uh, brooders that, that lay the eggs and nests on, on, on the reef. They are the one that's more restricting in, in range. Uh, I, I, I didn't have enough data on PLD for the Atlantic reefs at that time. So I used uh, uh, if a species is a pelagic spawner or a bench spawner as a proxy for, for the time spent in the plankton. But I put other traits that I have available as well, like body size, depth range, uh, uh, if the species uh, has, uh, is a habitat, habitat generalist uh, or not, if they live on our reefs or if they are found on reefs and the mangroves and estuaries as well or the sand bottoms. Uh, and what I found is that several <coughs> adult traits was uh, explained a lot of this uh, different distribution, but, but the, the, the spawning time was not significant. So the, the traits that was more, more significant, that were more, most expected to be significant for me, wasn't. And then I became with the hypothesis that uh, adult virus traits somehow, I don't know what, uh, how, but they are better predictors of the variability in range size. And then I thought, well, I want to test these traits against the PRD itself. Uh, but and I started to compile that in the literature, and I found that uh, I, I need to go global because there's not there are very few data from the Atlantic fishes, but for the Pacific fish, there's lots of data, lots, um, not so much. But uh, in the literature, I found like 360 species with this data. So. Uh, we went to collect more data with collaborators from New Caledonia that was doing this stuff with fish from the Pacific and the Caribbean as well, which helped us to, to get a lot of more data from the Atlantic fishes. And then we end up with uh, more data for further 144 species. Uh, for those who don't know how PRD is estimated, the, is, uh, the otolith is a year born. You, when you scroll down, and you, you can read the rings, each ring is sort of a day spent of the plant. It's much like uh, three rings to estimate the age in years. <clears throat> and uh, so I end up with PRD values for 509 species, which is a quite uh, impressive considering what we had before. So this is the large data set with PRD so far. And I compare these the PRD against spawning mode, <coughs> adult body size, school behavior. So things that I, I, I guess in that this, uh, that I have here, I have a hypothesis about. Maybe this uh, makes species be more widespread. Uh, and uh, we did this for, we, we have 47 families. So it's quite, uh, Data is, and uh, we went for a global analysis as well. So we have data for the Atlantic, we have data for the Eastern Pacific, and we have data for from the Indo Pacific. Uh, so because because 
regicides is constrained by the vision deficiency, and and, and the families can uh, is also uh, make the, the data non-dependent. Then we need to analyze this using mixed effect models to control for this uh, for family effects and, and vision effects. And uh, and this led to to other chapter of my PhD, and the results is that. Uh, three of the adult behaviors uh, of the adult tra traits analyzed was was uh, significant. They explain a fair amount of the variability in range size. The PRD was important, but only for the Indo-Pacific, not for the Atlantic, and not for the East Pacific region. Uh, so plotting this for each region, we can see that uh, PLD is all important in this in the Pacific, uh, but body, body size is a more general thing of geographical size as well, globally. <clears throat> and uh, looking at the other traits, uh, here I, I standardized the, the geographical range size with the region, so I got a percentage of the maximum attaining range so we can see that uh, schoolers can uh, they have higher, uh, larger geographical ranges than non-schoolers. Nocturnal species has larger than, than schoolers, and, and fish that are schoolers and, and nocturnal at the same time they have uh, they they don't have any species with short range at all. Uh, but one question that. Make us think: is How does adult biology govern geographic range size? If if the fish disperses a large, so this is what we call the realized dispersal. So is 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 the dispersal of the larvae plus the persistence of that larvae in that region? Because if the larvae reach isolated uh, uh, isolated island or reach a distant reef, and if that larvae uh, fails to, to, to settle and, and recruit there, that species will not be observed or counted. So we did not consider that range to go that, that far. And uh, if you look the traits, for example, schooling behavior, it's a well known trait that uh, uh, makes species safer from predation. If you are a schooler, you are usually uh, uh, safer. Uh, less predated, you have a higher sh chance of survival than non-schoolers. Uh, and at the same time, it's easy to find a mage when you go to reproduction. So if you are a schooler, you, you uh, maybe establish a population faster than if, if you are a solitary species, that, like a single one that recruits in, in that reef and don't have an uh, other counterpart to reproduce when it dies. So that species will become local, local extinct again. And when you are a schooler, it's also easy to get access to food resource. It's, everyone knows there's a part fishes like uh, aggregation to, to go into uh, denser fish territory and grazing. <clears throat> and the, uh, another interesting factor was nocturnal behavior. Uh, I was thinking. Uh, about if nocturnal behavior is a trait that uh, really, really was uh, uh, that fish are nocturnal to avoid during predators. And uh, I wasn't finding much evidence about that. But then this paper came from the heavens and, <laughs> and showing that uh, in the two atolls in the Pacific, uh, one have the fish in there when it has no sharks or very few sharks. We have the psionics, yeah. So then in the diurnal census, you find a lot of nocturnal species like growing out of the reef during the day. And when you have in, in the in the neighborhood at all, when there's lots of sharks remaining, these fishes are more constrained in the Hidings in the, in the reef, in the more nocturnal activity. So uh, maybe even if nocturnal activity did, didn't evolve to avoid predation, it's, it shows that nocturnal fish is maybe safer or at least exposed to a, a, a smaller 
subset of predators than diurnal fishes. <coughs> and and bar size, well, but bar size is an obvious feature that uh, if you're big, you have fewer predators because it's hard to, to eat. But at the same time, bar size correlates with longevity. A grouper like that can live up to 40 years old. And uh, when, when you live longer, and when you have like uh, uh, large gaps to be crossed for a species, for, uh, and, and, and these recruitment pulses are very widespread in time, the longevity may help for a population to get a in the distant reef. Because, for example, imagine you, a species has some uh, chance recruitment every 10 or 15 years. So if, if a tiny small body that, that lives two years has a pulse of recruitment in distant reef, two years after they will be out that if they don't reproduce that. And then when the second pulse came 10 years later, they will be always recolonizing that place in every big stabilization. But a grouper or another large fish that lives longer, so when the second pulse of recruitment came, they will find uh, the former uh, uh, population that that he could that for and that probably this will of course this is what called storage effect and this will long term uh, a, a big help to, to <coughs> population stabilization. So uh, the conclusions of this <coughs> work so far is that population persistence is more important than propagation dispersal for explain fish dispersal in general, in geographical size at least. And this uh, was well illustrated in this paper of Camilo Mora when he shows that, that the whole oceans is, is much more connected as we think. We, we, uh, he, he modeled like ocean uh, currents, directions and velocities and showed, and, and, and the blue uh, lines is, is, means higher connection, and the red lines mean uh, 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 weak connections. And then we, 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 we can see that pretty much our areas is, is under reach of most of uh, fish PRD. The only, the only region when we are, have really a, a weak connection is the Eastern Pacific gap, the, the gap between uh, the, the eastern part of the Indo-Pacific and the eastern Pacific region. And indeed, when I look back to my data, uh, I have I have PLD in, in the whole data set. As, as, as still a strong predictor, but uh, we, we saw that, that there's an interaction depending on the, of the region you're looking at. But when I remove it, the fewer, like 20, just 26 species, that was the trans-Pacific ones, that goes from French Polynesia or Hawaii until the, the Central America, from the 509 species, I, I remove it, 26 species, then PLD drop from the, the last significant factor. So it seems that these fewer species that cross in the Pacific, they have a, a, a huge influence in the effect of the PLD. So the PLD effect is dependent of only breeding uh, <coughs> that gap in the ocean. <coughs> so in conclusion, I would love to try to explain most of the variability in geographical range size and species ability to establish population and colonize. And, uh, it's more important for special potential, as said already. Uh, okay, uh, okay, going back to my first chapter, one of the factors that I identify as a positive correlation uh, predictor of crossing <coughs> the Atlantic from Brazil or Caribbean to Africa was uh, if, if the species was recorded living among rafts in the ocean or not. For example, uh, when you have uh, flotsam going around and, and there some species that can live uh, recruit when they are in the middle of the ocean, recruit in that, in that spot, in place, and, and this can help to disperse. But then uh, a friend of mine asked me the other day, look, if you 
if uh, the recruitment of species in these rafts are sort of by chance, the, any species that can be in the ocean can find in the rafts and, and recruit them and can go. So I don't know how how raft itself is a factor because this this is not a predictive factor because any species can 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 be in the raft. And, and this was a very interesting question. Oh, this is some pictures to illustrate the species. So we have even seahorses, which is very uh, unexpected, which would be like in the, in the middle of the ocean. And uh, okay, uh, okay. He, he, here's the plot that from that paper that shows that body size uh, species chance of crossing the Atlantic. Inclusive body size, but if they are a raft, it's much more. And then, based on that question, I think okay, so fishes, species that, that are rafting, they are like seafarers, like they, are, they have spe uh, specific abilities to cross the ocean, or they are like castaways, they're just marooned in the raft by chance. So, and to, to answer this question again, went back to the trade. Species threat analysis, and they use some some facts like diet, because depending on the fish eat, if they are plantivore, the chance to survive in the middle of the ocean is higher. If they are herbivore, maybe if you are, if, if it's a seaweed raft, they have more food than, than other uh, diets. Uh, if the species, how how they use the water column? If they are bent, uh, the marshal species that are always lying the bottom, of they are. A species that we call semi-pelagic, like jacks and travelers, that can go more higher in the water column. Of their species that don't go much higher than one meter of the bottom. Uh, the schooling behavior, uh, the habitat generalism, the depth. We think important because the, the uh, rafts are always in the surface, and the body size. Uh, and and I collected data. The most, not only on the occurrence of that species on rafts, but also if the rafts that species was found was seaweed rafts or what I call single object rafts, like logs, uh, containers, uh, buoys, all other stuff, uh, more discrete than because seaweed rafts can be huge, can be like uh, hundreds of meters of extension, three meters thick. And this is very common in the Atlantic. Uh, and what I found is that <clears throat> uh, if the, the ability of a species to swim uh, higher in the water column was a uh, very important predictor. So, which is, makes a lot of sense because in the raft, you, you don't have much room to, to lay down, you don't have much riding, hiding, so you need to always be swimming around the raft. Uh, and this is a general predictor regardless of the, the type of the raft. But other factors who have some interaction with the raft type, which are like, for example, multi habitat. If a species is found only on reefs or in reefs and in, uh, on sea grasses, uh, mangroves, and so, and so they are more likely to be on the seaweed rafts, which again makes some sense because the seaweed raft resemble a bit the habitat they, they found in the bottom as well. And, and for some species, like for example seahorses, they, they probably get the raft because they are holding the, the seaweed, and then when the seaweed like, uh, was uh, how can I say? When the wave surge broke out. Yeah, broke out and, and take them out to the raft, the fishes like seahorses probably go with, with the algae. Uh, and schooling behaviors was important for single object rafts, but not for seaweed rafts, probably because in a single object like a log, you need to be swimming around, you are exposed to predation. And if you are a schooler, you might be safer. And body size is important. Body size is a very tricky uh, trait to work with because body size is correlated with lots of other traits. So you never know uh, what exactly is, is, is doing 
the body size effect. You can only guess, okay, because large fishes are more generalist than small fishes, large fishes are safer from predation than small fishes, so yeah, it's, it's hard to disentangle, but, but still, it's, it, it's a predictive variable. Uh, so in conclusion, like seafarers, reef fishes depend on specific traits in order to disperse, uh, rather than being castaways that uh, drift in by chance. So it shows that, uh, uh, okay, uh, so rafting behavior is a predictive trait, it's, it's not a chance trait. Um, so this, these three chapters of my PhD, like, it was sort of one question leading to the other. It's very cool way to progress. And, and I think that in the end, it gives a very, very fresh tackle on this dispersal uh, question of reef fish, which will have been like a bit of stagnated in the last years. Uh, we can apply trait based approaches to a lot of other questions, unresolved questions in reef fish. But for example, there's a long controversy about the, the predictability or the stochasticity of the reef fish community assemblages. And this is most probably because we are always looking to the identity of species. Okay? Maybe we think that uh, that community is high stochastic because we are looking to the species uh, name. But if you look to the traits, what are you going to find? But there are other more urgent questions related to conservation that uh, trait-based methods can help a lot. Uh, I, will, I will show an example of another researcher before showing my homework. Well, everyone is aware about the lionfish invasion in the Atlantic Ocean. So in the, late, in the early 90s, lionfish started to be found in the, in the Florida. In the next 20 years, they spread along the east coast of the United States, and we found in Bermuda, and then in the Bahamas. And in the last 10 years, they spread all over the Caribbean. And two months ago, we found the first one in Brazil. So it's, it's a real issue. And the one, one of the impacts of the, the lionfish, that, well, lionfish is a predator, and they uh, eat uh, uh, small recruits, and, 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 and it was shown in the Caribbean that they, they, they can deplete a lot of uh, uh, recruitment of, of native fish there. And then uh, some researchers from Canada, uh, because lionfish have been cooling, uh, people are cooling lionfish in the Caribbean, so we have a lot of uh, diet data, the stomach content and ice. And they start to look at the, the fish that the uh, live fish are eating and the traits of it. And then some traits here. And they, and they present a very neat table with predictions of the traits. <coughs> That's the way I think that should be done. Uh, and they found, among several traits they look at, they found that small, shallow bodied like fish that are long, elongated, solitary fishes, not, not schooling. Found resting on just above reefs are most vulnerable. So, and, and cleaner fishes are less predating as expected. And uh, if you think this, this plot is it's a bit confusing to look at, you can do a beautiful plot like that. And here is clear how, if you are pelagic schooling, the, the blue color is, is less chance of predation, and the red ones is is high chance of predation. Here you have the body size of the species, and here the ratio of like the body shape. If the species is more elongated, they are, the ratio is higher. If they are more deep bodied, they are, this ratio is lower. And uh, if you are a solitary, nocturnal, small species, you have a higher chance of predation by lionfish, at least. And uh, if you are a schooling, not pelagic, but a schooling demersal, and you have a higher uh, uh, a higher reach of body length depth, you, you are more uh, vulnerable. And this confirmed our fears that uh, this is exactly the shape of the juveniles of parkfish, which have been highly predated by lionfish. 
in the, we, we, we all know how important pirate fish is from reefs, at least. I have been published a lot of stuff about that. And the sea should be like one of the targets of another fish. <coughs> and uh, the, the work I'm doing now uh, related to conservation is to look at the vulnerability to distinction of groupers. Uh, groupers uh, is well known as one of the most vulnerable uh, families of fishes uh, on coral reefs, mostly because they are good to eat. Uh, they are found in the live trade. They are large, so they are crawfish fishes for recreational fish as well. And because of that, the UCN uh, has uh, has made up a, a, a large um, body of experts to assess the the treat categories for for this family in particular. Uh, and and, and fishes has been uh, I think everyone knows about the UCN, but at least we have categories of treat critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable. Near treatment, less concern, and data species. Uh, recently, <coughs> groupers was assessed and published, and <coughs> all species, 163 species of groupers, all species of the family, was evaluated, and uh, a large proportion, 30% of species, is data deficient because the UCN use uh, population trends data to, to categorize. Trade. So, if they, 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 they need to have uh, population uh, abundance data and, and that uh, sort of estimate of decrease or not to assign treat category. So, a lot of species are data deficient. Uh, this is very high if you consider that all birds of the world you have less than 1% of data deficient species. If you look at all mammals of the world, of data deficient. So for a single family of fish, a lot of that data deficient, uh, a higher proportion at least. And uh, it's important to, to find a way to sort out among these species which ones are more endangered than the others. So uh, my question here is, is can, can we predict the, the trait category for the data deficient species <coughs> based on the the uh, common traits like body size uh, here sort of so body size the range of the species the depth because depth we always think of depth as a if, if, if species go deeper they are sort of safer uh, generalism of habitat if they form spawn aggregations or not because aggregations make the uh, we think that they are vulnerable to overfishing uh, if they change sex or not. And the region is, is always important to put the region in your model when you have geographic range as well, because of different you know, maximum range you can have. Uh, all these traits here we have for, for that, that, deficient, uh, uh, that data deficient species, except, except the sex change, which is wrong. But all other traits uh, we, we, is sort of well resolved. But there's a, a sort of me methodological problem in this analysis because the responsive variable is categorical. It's not like a continuous. So I have less concern. And, and this category is, is uh, ordinated from, from less risk of extinction to higher risk of extinction. And uh, the way people are, are tackling this question, I, I'm not particularly to ask this, of course. And uh, other papers that have been doing this for other groups uh, mm -hmm. just separate, like endangered from not endangered, and do a binomial analysis, which is, is a possibility, but I, I feel this is a very simplification. Because we, if you have the information uh, of a, a more hierarchical information in the, in the trich category, you are missing the opportunity to use the whole offshore data. Uh, and then uh, that's that's the thing about the trait based analysis. Sometimes you, you you demands you always to be learning about new techniques of modeling, new analysis. And I 
I end up with this original category for regression. And uh, one tip, when you, you, when you are stuck with uh, analysis for, for some specific distribution you have, don't go to, to the statistical department of the university. <laughs> go, go to the social science department. Yeah. Because <laughs> social science has a lot of the same problems that we ecologists have, and they are way advanced <laughs> than us in this modern approach. And, 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 and there, it's much more easier to understand the social science than a, a mathematician. Uh, uh, after you run the, the regression, you, everything else is the same, like the model selection, you can do it back, backward stepwise, or EAC selection, doesn't matter. So I end up with these uh, coefficients for like large, if the species are, they are more treated, the lower, the range more treated, the lower the maximum depth, they are more treated. And depending on the region, we have a level of. Uh, so the Atlantic ones is, is the most endangered. Uh, but the coolest thing about the, this, this categorical regression is that it gives to you these thresholds. So these thresholds uh, to sort out which categories you're going to put your species. So, for example, when you go for Let's take a, a species, a data deficient species, for example, the Thalos of the losses. They have a big body size, which we need to remember that to log transform because the model is log. So the log, of, I think, is a, a one meter and a half. Can this? So this times the estimate for size plus the estimate for square root of the range plus the estimate of the maximum depth of the species plus the region is a Indo Pacific species. So it ends up with this value here, h dot h37. And now you look at this number and see in which, where in among the pressure this number lie. And then you see that this species is predicted to be in the near treated category because it's here. h dot h37 is between h dot 2 and 1 dot 6. And applying this for the whole species that is data deficient, we can have a plot like this is a, a sample of 10 species, data deficient species. Uh, we have at least 50 species, I think, in the, among groupers. So this is just a sample. But now you have this is, so uh, far as I know, the most objective quantitative way to make a prediction of, uh, 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 of the, the red-list categories for, for data deficient species. And now you can at least see which ones you should uh, give more attention to collect more uh, data and, and to remove at least the, 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 the data deficient category. Uh, well, that good. <laughs> During our, our PhD, we are so well trained <coughs> to giving 15 minute talks that it's very hard to put together a talk for one hour, but that is so good. <laughs> so, okay, so this is uh, institutions and collaborators that helped me with my PhD, the literature technology. Well, I hope you enjoyed. Yeah. Thank you. preamble to the uh, <coughs> seminar and the write up, you referred to the plant ecologists and how they are sort of, I think the implication was that a fair step along the way looking at trait based approaches coming from Macquarie University would be astonishing if you, if you didn't. Uh, they actually describe their traits in terms of functional traits that are to be in right setting. They're usually combinations of characters like lead demography or trade offs between plant growth rates, seed size, and uh, uh, germination capacity. What you, the traits you were talking about were generally phenotypic variables like uh, size of official behavioural variables, but where they school. Do you see the traits that you're measuring, do you see this as a step on the way to developing? the sort of functional trait approach that plant ecologists have? 
I mean, it, I mean, basically, do you, uh, do you think trait-based studies are going to lead in the direction of applying to colleges? Well, I hope so. I think, well, there are two things that I'd like to, to, to say about the question. The first is, uh, there are some people, like Michel Kubik's group, you probably know about, a lot of papers come out now, they are, they are doing stuff, blending together these traits. But my, my feeling so far is that these traits that we have for fish, this is not like traits that, that you, 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 you measure. Like, we, we got this in the literature. You go to the five books and look, oh, this is a school dispute or not. So I'm, 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 tr I'm trusting what the five, the, the, the field book is saying. Because we have lots of species, and that is, it's hard impossible to get reliable data. So this data uh, is that data that's easy to collect. And, uh, and that's why we, we are using this in a preliminary way to try to, to, to have results that lead us. To, to a more uh, robust analysis, like, like uh, the people are prepared to do. Is there any questions from you, Q? Any questions? Uh, yeah. Actually, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, it's Chris Brown here from UQ. I had a question about the Groper vulnerability analysis. Shouldn't you also consider factors like um, whether that's a fish species and you know what, what are the threats that it's vulnerable to as well as the traits or, or economic factors like is it in a region with heavy fishing? Sorry, can you, can you speak this slowly, please? <laughs> so in the Groper threat analysis, yeah. the, wouldn't the IUCN category also depend on the status of the fishery um, e and economic factors, like whether that's a valuable species or not, whether it's you know preferred yes. species for, for fish aquariums. Yes. The problem with that analysis is that we can't use, in my predictive model, things that people in the UCN are using to categorize, because this is going to be like a circular analysis. So uh, this, this commercial importance, the trends in population decline, they are all used by, by the UCN group to, to assess these species. So I need to, to look at the other traits that is more readily available, mainly in particular for, for the data deficient species. And that's why I think that using commercial uh, importance for these species is sort of misleading in a way that you're going to be Predicting what, what the predicting what the the UCN people are, are read. Uh, so you you you're not predicting the signal risk. You're predicting what they are choosing. Yeah, yeah. I I, I, I hope it's clear. <laughs> so clear. It makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So, so sure. I, was, I was just wondering that when you were presented the. Uh, Predicted categories. You had confidence intervals on those predicted categories, which actually looked kind of narrow for me, given the traits you were using. So, uh, I'm wondering whether those are un uncertainties around the meaning prediction, or whether they're actual prediction errors. That is, do you incorporate the residual variation? In the yeah, yeah. Well, in those, because if the residual variation is large, then it may well span multiple thresholds. Mm -hmm. This this confidence intervals that what is we still work because we, we got the reviews back right? and uh, when the reviews said look we need to try to put confidence intervals because the plot original has only dots and now uh, I, I work with Josh uh, Josh gives some leads and I try to estimate I I, I confess I'm not not sure about what is if, if I did right but the sense of that plot. Is is that you can at least if, if you ignore the confidence interval, that's the that, that difference. If you look at the dot, at least you, you, you can you can assign a category of this. This thing is still sure. I'm, I'm not 100 sure. So I guess it, so there's two ways you, you could do it. You could take take the fitted model parameters and their uncertainties and put confidence limits. But that would be the confidence limits on the the average risk of a hypothetical species with that combination of traits. 
So if you wanted to actually predict the risk of that particular species, you have to incorporate the residual, residual variation prediction, right? Because you know it's a residual and you don't know what, where it is in that distribution. So which one of those you present is actually quite important because it's the latter that's giving you your prediction. Okay, lovely. Nice. You got talk after. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Osma, for a great talk. Um, you can think about a recruitment pulse. You can also think about it as a species invasion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the uh, pest control species invasion literature, um, there's a bit of evidence that suggests that even very highly invasive species, they're not always successful everywhere. Um, even though they have the traits that make them good colonizers, a lot of their invasions fail. So how much do you think there is a balance between the environmental factors and other species and competition and everything in the destination or the sink reef uh, versus the morphology or the, the traits of the invaders? Yeah, I think that towards a discretion, you need to have some sort of variability in the environment. And we, we always, well, I, I do incorporate this in the model, but I think that uh, we need to look at the difference between the source population environment and the environment when the species are going. Uh, and this is going to make that the analysis more specific from here to there. We, may, we can compare the, if the, that the distance in the environmental uh, similarity or not. And that, I, I think this is a step for the analysis because I, I just look at geographical range size and put all together. In the, in the Atlantic, in the Pacific. So the, the variability among, among, I think for that you, you, you need to go to specific dispersal elements in Europe. So far, for the Atlantic at least, we know that the, the Caribbean is very different from, from Brazil in terms of Brazil, the, the reefs of Brazil is not small, it's more like a rock reefs, with more like marginal reefs, with uh, corals. Uh, Growing on, on the rock, and, and we have one one coral reef proper speaking there, uh, and and probably it's it, it's it, it's a, a, a place to to look uh, because there we know there's a huge difference in the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or just a comment on it. I was intrigued by your rafting study. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of supporting evidence in these three points. There. One, there's four species of kyphosis in the Atlantic, not two. Second point, none of them are endemic to the Atlantic. They all have globe, truly global distribution. Point three, a few times in my life I've been fortunate enough to come on a, on a floating log about two to 3,000 kilometres in the ocean away from any uh, continental island shore, and they've had sexually mature kyphosis hanging around on them. So rafting really explains that uh, phenomenon in the Atlantic. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, about rafting, uh, I, I was amazed at how, how few data we have for the Pacific. Because the, the original idea was testing that big for the whole yeah. for globally. But we have so few data from, from the other oceans, and, and so, uh, so many for the Atlantic, that, that I need to constrain my analysis for the Atlantic Ocean. And, uh, I wonder if if, if, if this is a thing of uh, fewer observations or fewer uh, rafting stuff yeah. in the Pacific Ocean, I think it's something to think about the world for the future. Thanks very much. Thanks, Osmar, again.